Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encontra la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Fellow travelers, and welcome to this episode of the Park to Buy the Travel Show. I'm your host, Barry Kessler. I'm just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination. Maybe it's even yours, and that's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. The music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez. Now, Alberto is the owner of the Lapa Lapa Group of Restaurants. Those are the Lapa Lapa, Puerto Vallarta's oldest restaurant on the famous Los Muertos Beach and the El Dorado Restaurant Beach Club right next door. So you can enjoy that fantastic view of the Los Muertos Pier all lit up at night in beautiful colors or during the day in its grand splendor for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Seated with your toes in the sand right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. This week, we are going to go shopping. Yep, we are going secondhand shopping, actually. Uh, And it's a really cool place. It is a consignment store. It's in the heart of the romantic zone in Puerto Vallarta. And it's called Deja Nu. And Deja Nu's owner and creator, her name is Kathleen Palmer. We're going to visit with her. She's from Southern California. And I I was just so impressed with the place. And you will be, too. But before we get to Kathleen and Deja Nu... Uh, let's see what's happening this week in Puerto Vallarta, the 24th of December, 2020. Beginning Christmas Day, tomorrow, uh, until the 10th of January, Puerto Vallarta again will be going on a partial shutdown with bars and large private public gatherings and hotels, uh, gatherings and salons and on terraces, and of course, the nightclubs. We'll all be taking the brunt of the punishment, uh, all actually to help tamp down the spread of the Rona. Uh, Now, keep in mind, the rules may change and may be tweaked between now and Christmas Day. And these rules actually apply just to Puerto Vallarta, which is being treated differently than the rest of Jalisco. Uh, But here's what we know so far. From an article in Reporte Diario, uh, Puerto Verta will only close clubs and bars. Restaurants may work, it says. Uh, Puerto Verta will only close clubs and bars from December 25th to January 10th, while New Year's parties in hotels, lounges, and event terraces will be suspended. Uh, after announcing the containment measures of COVID-19 by the governor of Jalisco, Enrique Alfaro Ramirez, many doubts appear. However, Puerto Vallarta will only close clubs and bars from January the 25th, uh, I'm sorry, from the uh, December the 25th until the 10th of January. Uh, the New Year's parties that take place in salons, hotels, and terraces are suspended. These are measures for Puerto Vallarta. The other guidelines will be focused on the Guadalajara metropolitan area. This is due to an effort by Mayor Arturo Davalos Peña, who intervened so that the same measures were not taken since the economy in Puerto Vallarta depends on tourism. However, the municipal government reiterates that they must continue with health protocols, thus being able to control infections. For religious and worship events, the capacity is restricted to 25%, and the disinfection of the premises must be guaranteed after each celebration. Choirs and songs, as well as dancing groups and any manifestation that gathers people, are suspended. And as I said, there may be some tweaking here and there, but they they don't want people to get in and party. Obviously, they don't want people to get together and party together. Just plain and simple. So anyway, I have a link to that article from Reporte Diario in the show notes over here at www.portavartatravelshow.com. 
Uh, now, I'm having a little bit of a deja vu here because when I was in town in November, uh, there was a partial shutdown, if you remember, the whole week that I was there, uh, actually until the very last night. But this time, uh, I'm going to be there the last night of the shutdown, and then everything should be open, if things don't change, uh, for the remainder of my stay. So it's just the opposite this time. But once again, it is not a full shutdown, but a partial shutdown of basically bars and discotheques and places like that in Jalisco and in Puerto Vallarta. So while we were gone, uh, last week, some crazy stuff happened in the fair city of Puerto Vallarta. The, uh, the, the former governor of Jalisco, uh, Aristotle Sandoval Diaz, was knocked off. Uh, he was actually assassinated in Puerto Vallarta, happened last Friday night, actually early morning, Friday, uh, December the 21st, and uh, it happened at a sports bar, restaurant, hookah lounge place called Distrito Cinco, District 5, right across the street from the La Isla Mall, and right next door to one of uh, one of the favorite uh, steakhouses in town, La Vaca Argentina, uh, right, right there on the main drag of Francisco Asensio. Uh, and uh, the ex-governor was there for a couple hours, partying along with several people. He got up to take a leak, and he was followed into the bathroom by somebody who shot him in the back and uh, afterwards made an escape. Uh, The investigation was actually hampered by the fact that uh, employees were directed to clean up the mess and the blood and the, the guts and all that stuff and the bullet casings before authorities arrived, and uh, somehow a video of the... uh, of the whole thing was uh, <clears throat> not available. It looked like the system was tampered with or missing altogether. Anyway, let me read from this report from uh, the BBC. It says here, Mr. Sandoval was having dinner at the Distrito Cinco restaurant on in the center of Puerto Vallarta with three other people when the attack occurred. Investigators believe that it was meticulously planned as... The gunman waited until Mr. Sandoval went to the bathroom, leaving behind his two bodyguards. He was shot in the back, but not instantly killed. When his bodyguards uh, tried to get him out of the restroom and to the hospital, gunmen outside opened fire on them. Uh, In a video uploaded to the Twitter by a local TV station, dozens of shots could be heard ringing out. The bodyguards managed to drive Mr. Sandoval to the hospital, but he died of his wounds. Uh, Jalisco State Attorney General Gerardo Solis said that when police arrived at the restaurant, they found that the crime scene had been altered. When police arrived, restaurant staff had removed all the evidence inside. They'd practically cleaned the scene of the crime. Uh, This is going to hamper the investigation because the crime scene had literally been disturbed, Mr. Solis said. The owner of the restaurant and its staff are being questioned by police. Mr. Sandoval's time in office was overshadowed by violent attacks carried out by Jalisco New Generation Cartel. And uh, I have a link uh, to that particular article from the BBC in the show notes. Uh, The the governor was only 46 years old. He was a young guy. He was a rising star in uh, Mexican politics. He was a member of the PRI. Uh, uh, That particular party served as the mayor of Guadalajara from 2010 until 2012, and he was the youngest mayor to have ever governed Guadalajara. And uh, then in 2012, he ran against the current Jalisco governor, Enrique Alfaro, uh, for governor, and he actually beat him. Uh, Aristoteles Sandoval Diaz was just getting back into politics when... uh, He ultimately uh, met his death in Puerto Vallarta, and some are saying that it was a cartel hit. Others are saying it was a political hit. hit. Uh, We may never know, but it is a bad look uh, for the port city. Uh, There is currently a heavy presence of National Guard and Marines and police uh, stepping up and making themselves very visible. Uh, But we will no doubt be following up as more information makes its way to us. And rest in peace, uh, former governor of Jalisco. So if you are looking for things to do during the day, it is. It is whale watching season in Puerto Vallarta. It is in full swing. The ballenas, as they are called in uh, in Spanish, are uh, there in the bay. And as far as I know, there are no nighttime whale watching tours on the bay. So 
just remember, you know, use a, a legal whale watching tour guide. Uh, don't hire a panga to take you up to Moby Dick. Uh, they are there are there are designated whale watching tours, and the bigger the boat, the farther you will be from the action. You can, you can see the whales from the land, of course. Uh, you can spend some time. Actually, if you if you spend some time in the mornings looking out over the bay, you might get lucky and catch a spout and a splash, and it's a lot of fun. So take a little time and uh, and watch the water if you can't get out on a boat. Rodolfo the Blind Tenor has returned to the Malacan to sing to the masses. He was spotted by my buddy Marty. Marty said that uh, he saw him over at Parque de los Azulejos, Tile Park PV, while he and his lovely wife were at Burroughs Bar having something to eat and drink. So look for Rodolfo when you're over on the Malacan. Thanks, Marty. Thanks for the tip. And, of course, I will be looking for Rodolfo as well when I get back into town next month. Uh, now, over the last couple of months, I've been telling you the story about Marta and my la- my, my lost day pack. Uh, I left my day pack with all my recording gear and more on a public bus when I was in Puerto Vallarta back in November. And someone found it, uh, got in touch with me, and wanted to trade it for pesos. And uh, her name was Marta, and she wanted a reward uh, for returning my mochila, my, my day pack. So anyway, I finally gave in to the lady. I offered her 150 U.S. first, uh, 3,000 pesos. And, of course, she wanted <clears throat> 250. She wanted 5,000 pesos. And my wife said, don't pay her. She shouldn't do that. You shouldn't encourage her by paying her. And uh, on the other hand, I was torn between giving up all that equipment and the interviews that I had on the recorder and uh, she had all that. And uh, I had interviews on that recorder that hadn't aired uh, on the podcast. So I decided I would go ahead and I would pay that ransom and uh, send money to my friend uh, Anastasio. Now, I don't know what uh, what Anastasio actually said to Marta. But whatever it was, he must have really shamed her pretty badly because uh, she contacted me after uh, after the deal was done. And she wanted to give me back 2,000 pesos. She said that he told her that uh, he wanted to take a picture of her so that I could embarrass her in front of my audience uh, and on social media. So now, uh, now she felt bad. <laughs> she wanted, she wanted to return some of the money. And uh, anyway, I told her, "Look," I said, "Look, uh, Marta Anastasia was probably just telling you the way he felt, but that's that's not my plan." That's not why I wanted your picture. I didn't want to share it with with my listeners to shame you. But anyway, I told her keep the cash. I, I I I and I won't. I won't share your picture with anybody. And uh, you know. So anyway, that's how it all ended. Uh, you will never get a chance to meet Marta unless you happen to bump into me. Uh, if you do, then I'll keep it on my phone and I'll share it with you, okay? But otherwise, it's not going to go online. It's not going to go on my website. <sighs> Sheesh. Uh, have you ever tried to send mail from Puerto Vallarta you know, to the States? Uh, mail service has been pretty spotty, you know, here in the United States, you must admit, uh, I don't know how it is in, in Canada or in any other parts of the world, but it's kind of getting worse every day, I think. <laughs> but uh, if you think it's bad where you live, try sending a letter uh, from uh, from Mexico to the U.S. Check this out. Uh, from Mexico News Daily, rapid delivery letter took four months to get from Monterey to Dallas. Uh, fittingly, the envelope bore a postmark stickers with the images of turtles. This is published Monday, December 21st, 2020. It took 116 days for a letter mailed through the Mexican Postal Service to get from Monterey, Nuevo Leon to Dallas, Texas. Uh, The newspaper Reforma reported this. And uh, that is even after paying for rapid delivery. Mexico's notoriously slow mail service was the focus of an experiment by a newspaper staff who mailed the letter on August the 25th as an experiment to test the post office's efficiency. The letter finally arrived at its destination in Dallas, ironically, with two postmark stickers bearing images of turtles on Saturday four months later. (laughs) 
Uh, other letters were sent at the regular price to the municipalities of Allende, Nuevo León, Misquez, uh, Coahuila, y, and even to a neighborhood in West Monterrey, but they have yet to arrive despite being guaranteed delivery within two weeks. The address in Monterrey, in the Monterrey neighborhood to which the letter was sent is only 15 kilometers from the post office where reporters dropped it off. Uh, the letters to Dallas, Reforma said, apparently did not leave the Monterey office where it was dropped off until September 11th, 17 days after it was given to the postal staff. The newspaper also highlighted the story of Ernesto Rowe, an American citizen who tried to vote by absentee ballot in the U.S. presidential elections recently, but was unable to after his mail-in ballot ended up in limbo in a post office in Mexico City. Correos Mexico has suffered under a competition from private mail services and the technological advances that have reduced the use of postal services around the world. But nevertheless, Reforma said its snail pace is an issue in light of the fact that it managed a budget of four, uh, 5.4 billion pesos this year. Uh, in a recent tour, Reforma staff took of post offices in Mexico City, Monterrey, and Guadalajara, they found little had been done to modernize the operations or to provide better services. And I have a link to that article in the show notes. So look, let that be a lesson to you. Use email. It's a lot quicker. <laughs> All right, let's get to the interview, shall we? Sometimes I walk into a place in Puerto Vallarta and I'm really surprised. Like, why haven't I been here before, you know? I... It happens a lot. And uh, when I walked into this place, uh, Deja New Consignment, over on Ven Venusniano Carranza in the Romantic Zone, over on the south side of Puerto Vallarta, it happened to me again. It's, it's you know, one of those things. It's pretty on the outside with colorful paintings of stylishly dressed women uh, posing in their newly acquired duds. Uh, and the store is comfortable. It's brimming with very nice clothing of all sorts. There's jewelry, there's accessories and belts and hats and pants and blouses and dresses, all on consignment and all reasonably priced. Now, I'm going to let the lady in charge, uh, Kathleen Palmer, tell us about her idea, how it got started, how it got off the ground, and how she runs her consignment store and makes it work for her clients who buy and her clients who can sign. And she tells us how it works and how it can work for you the next time you're in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, she also has charities that she, that she favors and uh, she'll show you how she adds those into the mix. So let's find out ourselves. Uh, let's head right over to the corner of Jacarandas and Venustiano Carranza uh, Venustiano Carranza, 450, in fact, in the romantic zone of Puerto Vallarta. And let's meet Kathleen Palmer of Deja Nu Consignment Clothing in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. <laughs> Kathleen, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? And uh, what was your path that led you to Puerto Vallarta? I was born in Santa Ana, California. And uh, somewhere in my late 20s, I moved to uh, Washington, Whidbey Island, and then, nice. and then uh, Silverdale. I moved here uh, 10 years ago, March 25th, 2010. And um, I'd come here on vacation four years earlier. And on the last day of my vacation, I said, I have to live here. Um, I don't like the sun. I don't like the beach. I moved here for the people. Um, you, what, did you move here thinking that you're going to like work? Did you move here like thinking you were going to retire? What was the deal there? Uh, it was a soft retirement. I moved here with my former spouse and five months into it, um, I went off on my own and at that, you know, and, and I thought about opening up a store and kind of kicked it around. And at that point I'm like, all right, I can't kick this around anymore. I need to do this. And uh, and the name of your store is? My store is Deja New Consignment. Okay, so this is a consignment store. Um, this is not the original uh, location, right? No, we were half a block down. Uh, we opened October 1st, 2010, and we were there until August of 2019. Uh, the, the building sold, and so I, but I knew I wanted to stay within eyesight to maintain my client base. Yeah. And here we are. 
Yeah. All right. Well, your new place is beautiful. Thank you. And I love what you did on the outside. And of course, the inside is is really, really, actually, you know, you walk, you you never think, you think, hmm, this is kind of, I mean, consignment, it's like secondhand, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So you would walk into, usually you walk into a secondhand store and you go, okay, what do we got here? But this is really nice what you've done here. Uh, Tell us a little bit about how did that idea come about? I mean, you know, is it just because they didn't have one? <laughs> no, there was one here um, w- back when I opened. I uh, I had actually thought about opening a consignment store probably 20, 30 years ago and just didn't have the nerve, uh, confidence to do it. And then for the four years before I moved here, I was a manager with Value Village, which uh, some people know as Savers. It's kind of the same concept as Goodwill, but it's a for-profit company. And I managed a huge store. I don't know what the square footage was, but I had 40 employees. And so when I decided to, I know I was working there when I moved here and I just took their business model and shrunk it down. It was a business that I knew it was a business that I loved. And so, uh, and, and there wasn't a need for it, even though there was another store. Uh, there's, there's always room for more. I mean, okay. regardless if it's a restaurant or a store. Yeah. So how does, I mean, how does that, how do you work this thing? People come in, they want to, they, they want you to, to, uh, sell their stuff. Yes. And so how does that work? Well, there's two types of accounts. There's people that want to receive the money from their what they bring in. Uh, they bring it in, we go through it. We're not as particular as say a consignment store in the United States, as we have some clients that have to put 50 peso items on layaway, apartado. Uh, so we're a little looser with what we accept. And uh, so we, we inventory the items, we, we price them, we put them out for sale, and it's a three month contract. And then it's a uh, it's a 50 50 split minus the taxes. Okay. So, and then uh, the other type of account is there are some people who don't want the money from their items. So we have maybe about 10 nonprofit accounts set up. The, our, our house charity is Pasitos Toluz. It means little uh-huh. steps of light. Yeah. And they offer free rehabilitative care to children with severe uh, developmental dis- disabilities. They do. Yeah. That's great. Uh, love that group. Yes. So that's great. So if they don't want the money, they say, give that money to a charity. Yes. And Pasitos makes about 40,000 pesos a year off of their account. They don't have to do anything except come pick up the money. Wow. That is totally cool. Now, yeah. do you have to like, you have to register as like a nonprofit to do that? What do you have I'm to do? I'm not the nonprofit. Uh-huh. I'm solely giving them a outlet yeah. to raise money when people you know bring in the stuff for donations. And then anything that doesn't sell, we donate as well to their uh, thrift store in Pitial. Oh, I didn't know that, but yeah. thrift store there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So describe your, I mean, what, what kind of things do you take in? Uh, it's, I mean, you, you got to be, you, you, you can't say, I, you know, I'm going to take your, your Cadillac or anything like that. Right, so, right, right. If you can wear it, I can sell it. So it, jewelry, sunglasses, belts, clothing, shoes. Really? Yeah. So how do you guys figure out what to price it at? Well, I had really good training with the company that I worked with in the United States. I learned brands. I learned, you know, just a pricing strategy. So it goes by quality, condition, brand, um, how old it is style. So it, you know, we start with that. Um, and then from there it goes, so you start with maybe the brand and is it cute and what kind of condition is it in? And then we just price it. And I taught Coquita how to do it. And she's been with me, I think six years. Um, God bless me the day he brought me Coquita. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. Um, all right, so what would you say, you know, as, as far as price ranges go in here? What do you, you got things starting at what and how 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 expensive you got stuff in here? The average price is 100 to 160. It goes up and down from there again based on brand and quality. I had some men's Jimmy Choo shoes in here a couple of weeks ago that I sold for uh, 4,000 pesos. I think that's the most expensive thing I've ever had in the store. Um, and then, you know, if it's you know, uh, we have a 50 peso rack and we have 20 peso, you know, canastas, ba- baskets. Uh, that's generally things that haven't, haven't sold in three months. And then they kind of just, and then they we clearance them cut out. cut the price or they yeah. let it go or they right. say, you know, if you can't yeah. sell it, then whatever, right? Yeah. Then it gets donated. Yeah. Oh. If it doesn't sell about 1% of the people pick up their items after the three month, uh, contract, but most of them are just, they just want to clear their closets. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool too. Yeah. All right. Um, I like this. Um, all right. So 
Describe the kind of things that you do have here. Uh, our our main base, probably eighty percent of what we have is is women's, um, and maybe seventy percent of that is women's clothing. You know, ten percent uh, is accessories, and uh, our biggest sellers are blouses and dresses, uh, pants sometimes get marked down after two weeks because I, I allocate about 18 inches of, of rack space for that. <laughs> they, just, they just don't sell. Uh, and then we have skirts, shorts, capris. Uh, and then the men's clothing maybe makes up the other 20%. It sells really well. Um, and uh, again, mostly the, the shirts and shorts sell the best. I imagine you have your regulars that come in. We do. We do. We know them on a first name basis. And we have like Vicky comes in almost every day and kind of checks things out. And um, other people come in once a week, once a month and spend anywhere from 50 pesos to 3000 pesos, depending on what they're picking up. So, you know, you get people coming back probably a lot just to, to just to check what's new. Right. How, um, you know, how often do you get new stuff? I mean, it's probably every day. Or- every day, every day. I kind of, I, I kind of joke about like we're we're a hamster in a wheel, you know, and looking behind us, and there's always clothes behind us. So people bring in stuff every day. We process every day. We put clothing out every day. So it's different. So there's some secondhand clothing stores in town that are. Uh, appear to be the same, but they're what's called a paca. They buy bales of clothing. Um, and I don't know how often they get them in, but it's not daily. So we have fresh product every day. Yeah, yeah. And you're doing people a service, aren't you? Uh, absolutely. There's, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever priced uh, not made in not made in Mexico clothes because sometimes you know like there's there's an expression I'm I'm too broke to buy cheap clothing yeah because it just doesn't hold up so this is all you know it's already been washed it's already gone through the you know the process of of not being new and so it's it's not going to be bali or you know the the threads ripping on you or shrinking because it's already been through that process so anyway so imported clothes are very expensive here you know if you go to lounge you'll size stuff for you know sixteen hundred pesos so it, it provides a, a service in many ways in that, you know, we're helping out the nonprofits, we're helping people clear out their closets, some people are, you know, depending upon the money that they make. And we're providing affordable clothing to the neighborhood. Wow, yeah. So it's a win win all over the place. Yeah. Well, this, you know, so I don't know if you've ever walked past Dejanu, but you got to go inside, you know, because it is really nice, really nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, And bring some pesos. It'd be good too. <laughs> Pesos or dollars. Yeah. Do- dollars are all right. I think we'll take them. We give a good exchange rate. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, let's, let's leave Dejanu just for okay. a few minutes. Let's, let's go on out into the town. Um, if uh, you, this is kind of the bonus round. You know, we all eat, we all travel on our stomachs. So we are all interested in knowing what local people or people who live here um, eat. Um, so do you got a favorite breakfast, lunch, and dinner place? I do. Uh, my my go-to is Mi Cafe on Francisco Madero, about two blocks from here. Uh, fresh, clean, uh, just uh, Aldoberto does a wonderful job with the menu. I, I'm one of those people, I'll, I'll go to a place, and if I order something other than my favorite, I'm like, oh, I should have got the other thing, because I'm often disappointed. I have never been disappointed at Mi Cafe. I can order anything off the menu, and it's all fabulous. I had lunch there yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that place. Yeah. And then Salud down on uh, um, Olas Altas. Yeah. They, again, it's it's clean, fresh. And when I say clean, I mean just, I, I guess, fresh and healthy and just never disappointed. There's so many things on their menu I love. So that's breakfast. See. What about lunch? Uh, <laughs> me cafe. <laughs> yeah. Me cafe uh, again. I probably eat there four times a week. Uh, you know, I... Kind of do too. So what can I tell you? Yeah, when let's I come see. Here. So I also like uh, lunch. You know, I play cards a bit, and we'll we go to um, De Cantaro, uh-huh. uh, and I really enjoy them. Um, I don't get out of the neighborhood much for lunch. Um, I think that's all I've got for lunch. I have a lot for dinner. All right, let's come on. Let's go. With, let's go with dinner. dinner. A lot of because a lot of these people, you know, they're drinking their lunch. So tell us about <laughs> dinner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so dinner. Let's start in the neighborhood. Uh, there's Tony's Please, which is a little, very uh, kind of hidden, not hidden, but a uh, small neighborhood place with fabulous food, never disappoints. There's Maximilian's, Kaiser Maximilian's on Olas Altas is, is one of my favorites. I love uh, Barcelona's Tapas. And um, when you go to Kaiser Maximilian, what do you order? Oh, always the Gargonzola s- steak, the bread soup. Uh, I know that sounds sort of a bread soup. 
soup. It is absolutely amazing. Really? Yummy noises with every bite. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Bread soup. I've never had that over it's there. It's really good. Tarragon and uh, I can't remember what the other spice is in it, but it's really good. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm in uh, Barcelona Tapas, mm-hmm. you were saying. Um, any others? Oh, oh, lunch, La Mara. La Mara uh-huh. over off of, it's right behind the HSBC on Francisco Asensio. Theirs is really good. It's absolutely. And then, um, let's see. Uh, oh, for lunch, Pollo Feliz. That's at least once a week I go there. <laughs> you do? <laughs> I do. Yeah, okay. So that's, you know, that's like going to, uh, what is that? Oh, Pollo Loco a little El bit, Pollo you know? Pollo Loco. I think it's basically the same concept. Interesting side note on that. My mother worked for a sign company way back when, and they made the first signs for uh, Pollo Loco in Santa Ana, California. Is that right? There yeah. you go. Da-da. Oh, Two degrees of separation. <laughs> um I like El Rio. They have entertainment as well, and they have great ribs. So I'll go there, uh, you know, just for an afternoon of, of entertainment. And then, uh, let's see, where else do I like? Uh, Siam. Siam mm-hmm. is really good yeah. for... Uh, do you do lunch there or do you do dinner there? Dinner. Dinner there. For Thai. Okay. And then um, I just recently ate at Fajita Republic as well. How'd you like it? Yeah. I, I mean, I've you said, you, you, know, you mentioned it, so you, I guess you liked it. I do. And they do something a little different there with the fajitas. They add uh, jicama, which gives it a really nice texture and flavor. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, maybe I should try that yeah. at home. Uh, any hole in the wall places, like places that you would like never ever think that was really good and you walk in and just blew your socks off? Shenandoah's. Uh, it's over on uh, Cardenas, Lazaro Cardenas, next to the Baca Market, same same block, and fabulous. Um, uh, God, I can't think of his name. Uh, fabulous. Anyway, Fernando. Dish. Fernando. Thank yeah, you. That is yeah. it. Thank you. You Fernando know the place. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's really good. Excellent. Oh yeah. And I that's love Vicky. That place. Matter of fact, like I said, it comes in here almost daily. That's her oh, husband. That's the husband. Mm-hmm. Okay. Look at that. Yeah. I'm not, uh, wonderful. Um, uh, you got a favorite coffee shop? Um, I don't order coffee out too often, but if I do, uh, De Cantado has the best coffee in town, hounds down. And then my friend Gary and I walk to, um, on Thursdays, we go to Maximilian's, uh, their little coffee shop and we have coffee and that's really good as well. Yeah. It's a cute little, you can get a little dessert and mm-hmm. coffee and, you know, if you don't want to have dinner, you can still kind of sit out there and, yes. you know, you know, enjoy and, the, enjoy the view. And great, great service. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Um, if you were going to leave town just mm-hmm. for a day, uh, where would you go? One day's a co- tough call. I don't. I don't do beaches. I just. It's just just not my thing. Um, but I, if I had two or three days, I would go either to uh, when things are better, Donala. Tonala, I never quite know how to pronounce that. <laughs> I love going shopping there, and I stay at a little, you know, four hundred peso a night hotel that's clean and really close to the market there. Yeah. And another place I absolutely adore is Pazcuaro in Michoacan. Had the best. Um, oh, what's the name of that pasta? Carbonara there. I I ordered it four times in Italy, and the one in Pazcuaro was met better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they've, it's just beautiful. It's, it's the, uh, it's the, um, what do you call it? The, where everything, everything is grown. Uh, anyway, a lot of the growing of all the fruits and vegetables that uh, go all over Mexico are grown in Michoacan. And mm. it's absolutely stunning. It's about a three hour drive from Guadalajara, Tonala, and just green and lush and beautiful. Yeah. So now that's, that's more than a day. Though. You're going to do like three days. That's like for a that. three day trip. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I'll drive to Tonala, spend the night there, and then go to Pazcuaro, spend one or two days there, and then drive back. How oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. All right. Take notes, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you had a word of warning for a first-time visitor to Puerto Vallarta, what would it be? Don't be afraid. Uh, it's the safest place I've ever lived. Watch where you're walking. If you see somebody with a cast on the wrist, they probably weren't watching where they're walking. And don't get stuck behind your camera. Just just enjoy all the, the beautiful... I, if I do go to the beach, one thing I love looking at is the... Uh, the contrast of the blue ocean and the green mountains. So just, just enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. And take it all in, yes. soak it in. Yes. If yeah. you're at an all inclusive, get out in town. There's so many great restaurants. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any words of advice for a first time visitor? 
come to Dejanu. I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, no. Uh, besides, come to Dejanu. I mean, yeah, that should have been my that should have been my line. Come try, on, try the street tacos. You know, try, try, yeah, try the street tacos for yeah. sure. What was that warning or what to do? No, no, that was what to do. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah, definitely try the street tacos. Excellent. Yeah. Um, being a being a gringa, mm-hmm. is it hard to run a business here? It's not. I I don't know if the rules have changed since I opened 10 years ago, but it, I got an accountant and he just did everything for me. I mean, you know, walked me through it, went to all the appointments with me. Um, you know, are there some some struggles sometimes? Absolutely. It was a while before I got, I mean, I ran the store completely by myself the first few years and it, it took a while to get the right employees. Uh, that's probably the biggest struggle, yeah. finding the right people. And Kokita and Kari are very loyal, very honest. And I, and I they're like, they're like family. I mean, they truly are. And, um, you know, when you need some repair work sometimes or, you know, whatever, you know, getting people to show up on time or show up uh, can be frustrating. But yeah. once you're here for a while, you kind of, you, you get your handful of people that you, you trust and you get recommendations from other people. But other than that, no, it's uh, the, the, the Mexican people and the Mexican government have been very warm and welcoming. And it's been a wonderful experience. So don't be afraid, but get yourself uh, somebody like an accountant, right? right, To make sure that they can uh, walk you through this. Right. Because I I got some bad advice first and I did some things I didn't need to do. And uh, once once I got the accountant, it was just smooth sailing. Okay. And I'm with the same guy still. Yeah. Yeah. Loyalty, once again. Yes. There you go. (laughs) Gotta love that. Um, What do you, you know, what do you do... um, for nightlife around here? Uh, for nightlife, uh, my favorite thing is to do is to go to the local theaters. We've got some great talent. We've got uh, The Palm, we've got Act Two, and we've got Encanto. And uh, I, I mean, I've got some favorite drag queens that I go and see year after year after year. I mean, I used to volunteer at Act Two, so I got to know everybody really well. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with Kevin Levesque, Misconception, uh, and they're all fabulous shows. And the theaters are all, all putting in safety measures. Act Two's building a rooftop uh, lounge. Uh, theater so mm-hmm. people are outside and um, for the shows and then the Palm has put in a, a really good HEPA system and filtration yeah. system so I'm really looking forward to everybody you know coming back getting back to work and uh, bringing us entertainment yeah and uh, it's coming it's coming it's coming everybody and they're cabarets and you're so close and for the for the price you just can't get that kind of entertainment anywhere else yeah it's it's amazing how Inexpensive, it right. is. Yeah, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the price of the tickets just went up because of Barry. <laughs> um, the style of clothes that you see here and the kinds of things you take in, it looks to me like it's things that you would find locally here anyway, right? And people, a lot of cotton, you see, I mean, right. seeing a lot of that here. It's a mix. It's a mix. We get a lot of people bring, you know, their clothing from wherever they're from. And I I tend to see two surges in product coming in. One is the beginning of the season. So my, I imagine that people bring their new wardrobe with them and then clear out their old wardrobe. Ah. And at the end of the season, uh, like in April, we, we usually get really piled up with clothing as people are leaving. They want to clean out their closets before they go because things don't stand up well to the humidity. It's best to get them out and moving around rather than sitting in your closet. Yeah. So yeah. And we have, and we have some mantha, which is the local cotton, uh, style of clothing that's made here. That's so comfortable. So it's a complete mix. Yeah. Now I was here the other day when we were talking about, you know, doing an interview and it looked like you had quite a Quite a lot of stuff here. Was that what, what was that like an estate? What was that? Yes. Uh, I had a gentleman contact me and uh, his wife had passed and uh, he had asked, you know, how I could help him out. And he wants to use the money from the cl- sale of the clothing to help a school, a local school. And then whatever doesn't sell, he wants to distribute. I've contacted uh, Barbara and, and she's going to pick them up and distribute them in the neighborhood rather than the, the normal pasitos. Uh, uh, cycle that we do. And so um, I offer the service of I will I go there, I bring uh, you know a lot of large bags with me and I bring an assistant. And we make it really painless for the the person that's 
dealing with the estate. And so, you know, he waited in the other room and we just, we get everything packed up in about 10 minutes. We tell them, don't go through it. Don't worry if it's sellable or not. We'll do that for you. And um, oftentimes a lot of the estates uh, do donate the proceeds to uh, some organization. I've had others that have wanted the money to go to the children and then I, you know, they're in the state. So I PayPal them the money at the end of the, of the estate. My largest one was a, a lovely woman in the uh in the marina and it was like four truckloads my apartment oh, was wow. completely i looked like a hoarder i had things <laughs> just piled it took me about four weeks to process it all and it was really lovely you know jewelry and items from all of her travels but it's just it's just easy for the family it's you know i, I take care of everything for them yeah so. that is uh, makes it painless yes absolutely a lot less painless yeah because they're going through a lot right absolutely yeah um you uh, what what is what is your address here? What where where are we? We're, we're going to find you. We are on the corner of Venestuviano Carranza y Jacarandas, or Jacarandas, <laughs> uh, and it's four five zero Venestuvio Carranza. We're in front of the Oxo. We're a caddy corner from the Tortilleria, and we're across the street from the little fish taco stand. And you're on Facebook. I know we are on Facebook as Deja New Consignment, and I'm on there as Kathleen Palmer. Okay, and uh, you, any other um, website or anything like that, or no, you just you just done the Facebook? I've never gone with the website. I've just done the Facebook, and Cody is really good about almost daily taking pictures of the you know the the best of what comes in, and she posts pictures. We have people contact us to say, "Hey, can you hold that for us?" And you know, so we I've 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 held things for you know a month till somebody shows up, you know, and, and uh, so they they just they pay pay me them out. PayPal me the money uh, for something that they like. So if you go to our Facebook page, you can see what's coming in daily. And uh, I mean, that. what easier way is there to shop? That, the size is on there. The price is on there. Yeah, that's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, is there something I left out? Is there something that you wanted to say before we said goodbye today? You know, I can't think of anything. I think you did a great job, Barry. Oh, well, thanks for that, <laughs> Kathleen. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I am I'm extremely impressed with with what you have here, and Thank I know you. that my my uh, listeners are going to be very impressed with your shop as well. Thank you. And I just want to thank you so much for allowing me to introduce you and my listeners to Deja Nu. Thank you so much, Barry. Have a wonderful day. All right, thank you, Kathleen. And uh, wow, like I said before, this was a really, really a real surprise. It was a great place to go. Make sure. Next time you are in Puerto Vallarta, that you stop by, you see Kathleen, uh, and pick up some really cool new clothing that you can sport while you're in paradise. I have links and I have uh, all that other great stuff, lots of pictures in the show notes and a map that'll take you right to the front door of Deja Nu, consignment clothing in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Well, all right. Well, that should do it for this week. Uh, next week, stay tuned for more on-the-ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, with travel tips, great restaurant excursion ideas, and more. But until then, remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions about all things Puerto Vallarta. If you think of something I should be talking about, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending us your message. And remember, if you're considering booking any type of tour while you're in Puerto Vallarta, you need to go to ViartaInfo.com, that's JR's website, and reserve your tour through him. Don't forget JR, reserve your tour right from his website. Remember, this is a value-for-value value proposition. His experience and on-the-ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta, in exchange for your making a purchase of a tour that you would do anyway, you're just doing it through him as a way of saying thank you. Thanks, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you were going to use someone else. So do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me about your experiences. Maybe you can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off a message. And don't forget, he's got his maps, his DIY tours, his revitalized happy hour board, and more. And I have links to all of those in the show notes. And once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time and subscribe and give me a good review on iTunes or wherever you happen to be listening to this podcast or share it with a friend that's even better. Uh, that way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place to go to Mexico. And remember, I made it easy for you to do just that with each episode I create. But if you haven't been to my website, you really need it. Have a look there. I have links to the places that we talk about. I have interesting pictures and more. 
all right there in the blog posts and in the show notes for each episode of the show. So check them out for sure if you haven't already. All right? All right. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen Palmer of Deja New Consignment in Puerto Vallarta. Make sure that you make Deja New one of your stops the next time you come to Vallarta. Guys, if you want your lady to be absolutely in love with you, take her there. I have maps, I have links, I have pictures. Get out there. And thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Port of Vallarta Travel Show. This is Barry Kessler signing off with a wish for you to slow down, be kind, and live the Vallarta lifestyle. Nos vemos, amigos. Samba de Puerto Vallarta